Well, welcome back to another Random Land on location. We're here in Fountain Valley, California, just three miles or so from the Pacific Ocean. I was heading down to the beach and I was thinking, you know what, I don't have any shorts on. I don't have a boogie board. I don't have anything. Maybe we should stop in Fountain Valley and check out some of the shops, see if we can pick up some of that beach accoutrement. We were gonna go into the bra garden. Unfortunately, as you can see here, the bra garden is sadly closed. But that's when it hit me, wait a minute, right next door to the bra garden, don't we have a friend with his own shop? And isn't that shop a little bit unusual? And furthermore, if we stop into that shop, I'm pretty sure we can see a piece of movie history, a cinematic treasure that nobody has really seen since the 1930s. Let's go check it out. Oh my goth, look at this store right here. Look what we have over here. It's funeral classics. Look at this, they've got clothing, they've got collectibles, they've got curio, and it's all related, as you would expect from a business called Funeral Classics, to funerals and deaths and spooky stuff. Look at this, not only can you get your spooky accoutrement, no boogie boards, no surfboards, no, no sunning lotion or whatever in there, you can actually get a ride to your final destination. Because I believe this is a classic old school hearse. They do it all. They can dress you for death and take you straight to the grave, baby. Yes, sir. Funeral Classics is located right down here on Warner in Fountain Valley, California. And it's owned by a friend of ours who we keep running into at all kinds of spooky conventions, Midsummer Scream and stuff like that. Guy by the name of Rob Thorne, who we call Tattoo Rob. We're going to see if we can rustle up Tattoo Rob and get a tour of the shop. All right, guys, don't be alarmed. Don't be frightened. There might be many frightening things in here. Let's see if we can rustle up Rob. Tattoo Rob, where are you? Oh my gosh, look at this. Tattoo Rob has died. Oh no, he's alive. He's returned from the grave. Hello. Dude, Rob. Welcome to the parlor. What is this place? What are we looking at? This is Funeral Classics, my little parlor in honor of the dead. And what do you got in here? What's the best stuff? If we're walking in off the it's street. It's all the best. It's all the best is. It's based on my t-shirt designs. I design them, I hand print everything. That's right, so that's based on a clothing line, based Funeral Classics, clothing line. and you make stuff like this. Look at this over it's here. Deathly Land. Deathly Land, and what's this? Well, we got the Funeral Classics, we got a little Edgar Allan Possess. <laughs> some more Funeral Classics to the dead ones. Like I said, it's all in honor of the dead. There's some, you know, comedy tragedy it goes together hand in hand and but. this is your shop how long has funeral classics been here nine years here nine it's, years yeah, ten years this October 13th and this is the first time I've managed to make it in finally sorry dude finally. I've driven by like two or three times and seen it I'm like oh there's the no, thing and there's I, Rob's I've, shop I've seen the eggs on the window yeah that was me what? but I didn't manage to make it in and I wish I had because <laughs> look at this come over here and check this out there's so much stuff in here Rob is this all like your personal collection? Or is this stuff for uh, sale? Most of it, actually 99.9% .9 of it is for sale. Oh my this, gosh. Don't mind this area, that's my work Okay, area. so this is that's your that's workstation here with the Deathly Land stickers from Funeral Classics. But look at this, you got all kinds of punk rock Stickies. stickers. We got old, old rock mags. We got old crazy mags. We got a little bit of car culture. Dude, you got everything. Tattoo mags, chopper mags. Books. What's this stuff up here? Oh, this is all the stuff you don't need but can't live without. <laughs> I like That's that. stuff. There are way more action figures in here than I was expecting, and yeah. I'm so stoked on it. It's actually, for being again, a parlor, a small place of business in the dictionary. I love There's it. There's a lot of stuff in here. And again, it goes back. How long did it take you to assemble this insane collection? Because I put stuff together for like my antique store booths and stuff like that, and it is hard to find choice items like this. Uh, being a tattoo artist, I get a lot of, say, gifts. Oh. You know, thank you, I know you're into this. You, you get know. access to people's sneaky I collections, do. like, hey, I might have some stuff you might want. Do you do tattoos in here? No, private okay. home studio. Private home Raven studio. Tattoo. We definitely do not do tattoos. In What's it called, oh. Raven Tattoo? Raven Tattoo. Okay, we'll have to look oh. up Raven Tattoo. What's going on right here? Oh, that's just, uh, you know, some background. You got the old school VHS playing. You got a freaking got Atari a, right here. Yeah. And then I like score. this. I just turned over Asteroids finally. You got the Clash right here. You got a bunch of punk rock stuff in here, well, which I, leads I, me into asking you about I, your band. I am a death punk, definitely. A death punk. But you were in a band 
one specific band Who that knows? I know of, but you were in a couple bands. What bands were you in? Um, going back, the Living In, but not the Australian one. Right, the other Living In, the, the good one. one. Um, really cool band called Marshes of Glen. Good old 80s style death rock. Death rock. Not, What's the difference between death like, rock and like, just punk rock? Well, definitely the... Uh, the amount of black? Yeah, the amount of black, the subject matter, you okay. know? The chords you play. You Dude, know? I'm very distracted. <laughs> Look at all this stuff. Look at this guy in here. You don't just have like your own shirts. You've got all this accoutrement. Well, all the artwork is mine also. Oh, wait, that's what I was going to yeah. ask about. I said, you got all yeah. this artwork in here. You did all this? Art by Thorn. Dude, I've never seen your artwork before. How come you don't bring this to Midsummer Scream? You know what? ADD, OCD. I can only concentrate on a few things. Oh, my. Dude, I like the art. Look at that, look at some of the decor in here. You ever see a shop like this? Maybe Spirit Halloween, but that is a temporary store. It's not here all the time. And you're here 365 days a year, right, Rob? That's right, 366. And what is- there's leap year sometimes. Ooh, 366? Oh, uh, smart pants, Sounds huh? a little scary. Okay, what do we got over here? We got, are these the things for Ouija boards? Yeah, <laughs> homemade planchettes. Homemade um, planchettes. My friend, Madam Gothic Vamp, does these. Little seance oddities. And this is, and like jewelry right here? And jewelry. Yeah. Ooh. I did it again, didn't I? Morning jewelry and seance oddities. Morning jewelry, <laughs> seance oddities. And you painted all this stuff right here? Yes. Okay, so you just told me a second ago you're from Huntington Beach, California. Yep. Born and raised. Born and then raised. you got into the whole band scene, the whole death rock world. Is well, that what we're calling it? Uh, we could call it that. The punk scene yeah, and all that well, kind of stuff. Okay. Going back, my dad played drums for Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry, B.B. King, jammed with Hendrix for a bit. Dude, that's so insane. So I was always around music. But then my taste, even by the time I was like four or five years old, was Alice Cooper. Right. Or, you know, Kiss? Kiss was everything. Oh, a little my bit of Kiss. My dad did the right thing. He came home one night. I remember I was listening to The Who, vinyl, and I'm like six years old. First two Kiss albums were out. But I had not a clue who they were, right? Dad comes home and says, hey, I want you to listen to this. Listen to it. So he played the first two albums, right? Kiss and Hotter Than Hell. I went, yeah, I love it. Then he went, this is what these guys look like. <laughs> oh, so you heard the music I first. You didn't see the first. covers. Oh, oh, my gosh. And I wanted to see him. This would have been 75 I would have seen him live. So I was like, immediately, let's go, right? Right. Saw him for the first time in 76, Anaheim Stadium. Changed my life. No kidding. Absolutely. So then from there, you're sucked into the whole music world. Yeah, absolutely. And then you were in the bands forever. But how does the, how do you go from being in the bands to starting all this? Well, going back to bands I was in, one was called Damnation. It was definitely a horror punk rock band. Whenever we would tour, we'd always go to cemeteries. Our favorite places are dive bars and cemeteries. Mine. Why is that not surprising? Yeah, it works. But yeah, that's one of those things that no matter where you go, there's always something like that. To right, do. to I check mean, out. Yeah, I mean, so you were always there's, into there's this. There's always a grave, there's yeah. always a cemetery. You were always I mean, into no the spooky side of Absolutely. like the rock scene, the look. Well, going back again, like growing up, you know, grandma's favorite movie of all time was Frankenstein. You know, so. <laughs> Being half raised by them, you right. know, while mom was working, you know, I would be going to every horror movie that came out, but also at the same time, you know, Channel 5 or whatever was on, you know, midnight, I was hooked. And so, yeah, growing up, you know, Boris Karloff, Bella, Vincent Price. Right. So what do, you, what do you think people misunderstand about this stuff? I mean, more people um, get it now, I think, than yeah. used to, when you say, but yeah. what do you think the normal yeah. people that look at this stuff and go, what the heck? What do you think they miss those, about those this whole scene? Those aren't the normal people. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think they miss, though, that about this that's so fun? Um, I guess a little thrown off, you know? Yeah. Maybe a little uh, uncomfortable is a good word because, you know, just the black uh, on an average the most imagery people don't want to think about death they don't you know it's that taboo subject sure sure but but i i think it's fun like look at this no that's the thing there's you know and going through history and you know traveling all over the world you realize that yes there is comedy and tragedy if you don't have a little laughter with your death and vice versa then what's the point you know yeah but yeah going back i think you know, more and more people are 
not so, you know... Uptight. Uptight, shocked by it, you know, thrown off by it. Yeah, Midsummer Scream is bigger every year, so, I mean, you every just year. see more and more people, like, getting comfortable letting their freak flag fly a little like bit, everything. as we were saying. Everything. But how did you how did you get into the clothing thing? Did that Was that just an extension of, like, um, band merch? Really collecting everything since I was a kid. I mean, by the time I was in literally fourth grade, I remember, going to Disneyland, and, and I still have it at home, and getting the big plaster skulls, right? Yeah, Randotti skulls. Ah, there you go. But they were round at the top, so I would literally cut the top off, put a candle on there, and so from that moment on, everything had to be custom in my life. From doing my homework, oh. to my bicycle, to my surfboard, to my right. skateboard. To your car? To my cars, <laughs> yeah. To my, to my girlfriends, no. Um, what? My very first shirt I ever printed was an Elvira t-shirt, right? And I only printed two. We're talking 1980. 82, I think. Wow. And so, you know, you couldn't just go down the street and buy How one. old are you, dude? I'm 55 years are old. Are you a vampire? Because you don't look like you're 55. Hopefully, I don't look like I'm 40, and we'll, we'll just cover that up. We'll edit that part out. What's the best thing in the collection right now? What's the top seller inside Funeral Classics today? Top seller. Lots of Deathly Land stuff's going out the door. Deathly Land right here. I get a little bit of everything. That's the beauty. Like, those people who just walked in, they wanted to buy records, and some collectibles so you can get old school vinyl records you can get your uh, deathly land mug you can get stickers coasters t-shirts you got it all in here pretty much pretty much everything pretty i don't much. see costumes but pretty much everything uh, about that yeah really no costumes even though people come in and like hey you do you have stuff but what i can do is when i come across stuff i will bring it in and it usually takes off. I thought I actually had some costumes in there. You got some stuff. You got a couple masks. You got hats. You got sunglasses in here. I just don't know what's yours and what's for sale. There's so uh, much awesome much stuff. Everything is for sale. I've always loved packaging. Dude, me too. I've always had an obsession with like packaging design, you know? <laughs> At one point, when I moved to my apartment that I still live in, um, the ceiling was covered in basically vintage uh, Count Chocula, Oh my gosh, boxes, yes. Blueberry. Booberry. I love that, dude. Blueberry, Halloween blueberry. packaging everywhere. It wouldn't be a horror slash goth slash rock shop without Elvira and Eddie Munster and in it. Butch. Look at that. Well, Look Butch at that. came down and when we opened up the shop at Electric Chair, he came down and did signings and everything. We That's had, awesome. In a parking lot that holds barely 20 regular cars, I think we had 25 hearses in there somehow. 25 hearses? Which is pretty much a joke. Oh my gosh. Where was the shop in Electric Chair? Because I remember Electric Chair, but I don't remember seeing your stuff in there. And actually, you would walk in to the door and my shop would be to the right, but I had a wall. I love that. One thing, <laughs> I literally took it off of this shape perfectly, the actual toe pincher. But that was my door when you'd walk into my shop. This was right here? Technically, it was the same shape. So, you know, you had the coffin had shaped toe, door. Toe pincher shaped door. So you went through that. You're calling it a toe pincher? That's a toe pincher. <laughs> I've never heard anyone say that for coffin, yeah, yeah. for like a casket. What's the difference between a casket and a coffin? This is a coffin. Casket's the one with the straight sides, right? Exactly. That's a coffin. This is a coffin. Or okay. a casket. Casket. Man. Casket, thank you. We'll figure it out. We got it, I know. Yeah, and even this one. Oh wait, the shelves are made from caskets? I didn't even notice that. Look at the side, Tyler. Look at the handles on the sides. No, Check that is, out right there. This is a legit casket that I got from a mortician. I tattooed them. I'm not going to say who. What? This is a legit one. Oh, you're kidding. So this is a real casket That's right a real here. casket. Is this a real That's skeleton, beautiful. Rob? Yes, it is. Where did you get this real skeleton, Rob? Can't tell you. Okay. Well, Can't tell you. We'll edit that part out, too. Because I'm not done eating it yet. <laughs> oh, 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 cut! Oh, cut! I'm having some trouble, Rob. Maybe you can help me. I'm looking for something in black. In black. Do you have um, anything in black? I don't, uh, black's a tough Black color, shirt um, somewhere in here. Something, maybe something for my friend, Fake Tyler. He really loves black. He doesn't wear any other color. You think there's something wrong with him? Tyler. I don't know, man. 
He's back and black. All right, now in addition to coming here for Rob's shop, I told you we were coming here to see a piece of movie history. A piece of movie history really nobody has seen since the 1930s. And we're gonna step outside of Funeral Classics. And Rob doesn't keep this in the shop. He brought this here specifically to show us we're gonna see something freaking awesome right now. And I haven't seen this yet. This will be the first time I lay eyes on this at the same time as you. And I'm not looking on purpose. <laughs> and now I'm ready. Oh my gosh, dude. All right, Rob, tell us what this is. Cause I know what this is, but our friends out there don't in TV land. This is the prop head used in the 1931 Frankenstein by James Well, makeup Jack Pierce, actor Boris Karloff. This was actually sculpted by Stuberg, on uh, a lady who was the main head sculptress at Madame Tussauds London because there was not a Madame Tussauds out here in 1931. And the like, crazy thing is, it would have been about 93 years ago this month that they're actually filming Frankenstein. So it was filmed in August. So this was created by Jack Pierce, the makeup artist for the original Boris Karloff Frankenstein as like a, a style guide almost for Frankenstein so that he could go back and reference this for consistency. That's what you're saying? Makeup consistency. Make sure all the bolts, all the little scars, like this little guy right here featured so prominently. And one thing is, and I'm not going to show you people because this has something to do with my Frankenstein's Graveyard Classics reproduction company. The detail goes all the way around, which I'm not going to show the back because if any uh, imposters out there try to reproduce this, they're not going to know what it looks like in the backside. And it's amazing. Not only is the detail completely there, and it is made out of wood, resin, with that was going to be my next uh, question. What the heck is it made out of? And the thing was, the pictures from the Jack Pierce studio, there was like kind of like a tripod sort of little stand, with probably like a velvet black little piece of material, which you can see in the pictures. And that was one of the things, right when I saw this, I went, okay, that is Jack Pierce's makeup studio prop head. And not only that, but it was this handle that gave it away even though you can't see it. There's no way somebody would be using this for like a haunted house or something and doing this. This was for Jack Pierce to go lift under and move it to make sure that all the little angles that he needed, this little bit of masking or whatever, masking tape, whatever it is, definitely put on by Jack Pierce. This little tiny guy right there, which is crazy to think of, but also, this is yak hair, Jack Pierce's favorite choice of hair used for the wolf man and other such things. But Jack himself meticulously put all these little hairs into place. One of the theories which I came up with and was backed by certain, certain people, experts, yeah. certain experts was how come the hair is so thin? Because you see the pictures and it's really thick the way Frankenstein's was. The theory is this was also used for Bride of Frankenstein. Oh. And they took some of the hair out because he was burned. Yeah, when he has the burn one. damage. And so that's why you see a little bit more hair. Because I don't think it just fell out. And again, this has been in the family since the 50s. Okay, so now you've got to tell me how in the world you, Rob, Tattoo Rob from Tattoo Funeral Rob. Classics, got your hands on Jack Pierce's Frankenstein reference head because right. this hasn't been seen by anyone for a hundred years almost. Um, almost 67 years no one else but my own family has seen it. Yeah, so um, how did it get in your family? Grandpa and grandma loved going to yard sales, garage sales, you name it. <clears throat> they were also always going up to Hollywood. Actually grandma had family in the business. Frankenstein was grandma's favorite movie of all time. The story is Dude, grandma, you had a cool grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I had the greatest, yeah, it, all of them. So grandpa was up in Hollywood, and whether it was a yard sale, rummage sale, whatever, he bought this head and the other item I will show you in a little bit for grandma. 
And he didn't have a clue what this was. Nobody had a clue what this was until I saw it again about six, seven years ago. Really? So they just knew they had bought some kind of, oh, look, it's some kind of he, he prop, just bought it, mannequin like, hey, head. Cool, check this out. No way. And, and the funny thing is, and there's pictures I need to find because I have seen them, but this was dressed up like in a full suit and everything, right? And they would leave it out for Halloween. I mean, we're literally like overnight for two or three days a week as like, you know, decoration. N again, not realizing, you know, that this, value. yeah, that it has huge historical significance. Yeah, no um, kidding. So when you figured it out, how did you figure it out? Were well, you just like, remember was, that old Frankenstein head? Well, again, growing up with this, one of my very first memories is Frankenstein coming to visit me in my playpen, literally two years old. And what that was, was my seven-year-old uncle with a big jacket, the head and the hand, and you know, he would try to scare me, but I wasn't scared. I was actually stoked that Frank was visiting me. Sure. And so this was always Frank, right? Fast forward, meaning me, I probably the last time I saw this was, I was probably like nine years old, literally. And so between all that time and being so into Frankenstein and all the monsters and everything, I was always curious about this prop head that would show up in some documentaries and pictures. Right, okay. Right, And I know I kind of skipped a little forward there, but we're talking, I hadn't seen this in years, but anytime, that, and this isn't actually a lot of universal documentaries, right? Right, right. And Guillermo del Toro just did another documentary, or uh, it was Karloff, the man behind the monster, or something right? That's like that. such a good documentary. And that's in there again. It's totally. totally yeah, I screamed when I saw the picture of this <laughs> online. Like, Wait a Because you've been telling us about this for years, and I yeah. hadn't seen pictures again. And then one day there was a picture of Jack Pierce doing something, yeah. and this head is behind it. Well, luckily there's two pictures in existence of this. One's a front shot, and one's a shot, a side shot. Which, thank God, there is. Um, that going back, seeing the documentaries and just being into this stuff, the picture would be there because it'd be like just Pierce and this prop head or it'd be Karloff, prop head and Pierce. And so me being into it going, oh, whatever happened to that prop head, not realizing it was in the attic in my grandparents' house next to the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Grail and everything else. <laughs> yeah. But um, what happened was I was literally one day tattooing a makeup artist buddy of mine, and he does stuff for like American Horror Story and CSI shows. So whenever he would come over, I would put in makeup documentaries. And I'm gonna go back a little bit. Probably like in high school, ninth grade, 10th grade, I was thinking about being a makeup artist because literally like Evil Dead 2 right. was just like, that was the thing. I'm like, okay, that's what I wanna do. <laughs> Never did it, that's all good. So what happened was, I'm literally tattooing my buddy, and I look over, and, and there's the prop head, right? Whatever happened to that? I get a call from my mom, Lovey, who you met. Yep. My son, Raven, because they were at my grandparents' house, who had passed away, mom took over the house. Okay. They were cleaning out the attic, and everybody knew, once you find Frank, to call me sure I just want it for my home what better place for it to go well, than you know yeah and, and again not there might be someone in the not, family not who's into this stuff yeah you know? so what happened was I literally finished tattooing my buddy I got a call hey we found Frank jumped in my hearse flew to Boyna Park and the funny thing is I walked in the house and I'm pretty much standing where my playpen was as a little kid not an adult playpen, but my little, my little kid <laughs> I'm playpen. glad you clarified that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and well, the funny thing is, it was like, they'd always put me right next to the fireplace. So me and Frankenstein had this like fire thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we had a bond. <laughs> and so my mom came down the hallway hold, holding it perfectly. And immediately I went, that's Jack Pierce's, oh my God. So literally the same day you're watching the, the documentary day, with your buddy. Even though I've seen the documentary sure. you know, probably 50, 60 times, you know what I mean? Because that's me. I've always popped in documentaries. And so I recognized it immediately, went home, 
got a hold of Christian Horvath at uh, Universal, head of archives and collectibles. I sent him a picture of the Jack Pierce and the prop head, asking if there was any information on these, sure. which, which I already knew there wasn't because I would have known, you know. And so he got back to me. This was a, literally a Friday night, like six, seven o'clock by the time I got back. By about eight o'clock, he got back to me going, no, there was no information. It pretty much disappeared when Jack left. Wow. So then I sent him the backstory, some pictures. He definitely said, yep, yeah, that's it. That's the one. Uh, no kid. So right away, you're getting confirmation from Universal. Right I know you've away. taken it to other experts who've had yeah. their look at it. And, and Well, I, I've taken it to auction houses and even found out even more information. I told them stuff and they told me some stuff. And that being said, they pretty much, it was like, okay, this is great. Let's auction it off next week. Sure. I'm like, no, because my whole plan was TS get a reproduction company going, which I have done, Frankenstein's Graveyard Classics. We're doing reproductions of this, the hand, and also another head that I have, a cast of Boris Karloff for a makeup practice test for Bride of Frankenstein. Oh, that's right. So this isn't the only thing you brought that's us to see. I have two other things for you that pretty much between this and the hand are probably the most prestigious collectibles in horror. History. Yeah, I've never been People allowed think, to see anything like this. No, this is, uh, and I've taken it to conventions, but it was also like, I mean, I've seen, up, I've seen the know, bat from the original Dracula and the couple props they had in Natural the History ring, Museum, the yeah. ring, and there was like from Frankenstein though. All you ever have is the lab equipment or maybe that ball chain thing. You never have Jack Pierce's own makeup reference, mo and he's the guy who designed the monsters. This is a piece of like. Uh, when well, you think of Frankenstein, you think of this. Yeah. The forehead, the flathead, the scars, the the bolts on the neck. I mean, this is it's like... Iconic. So, it's so did he create iconic. this first before doing the makeup on See, Boris Karloff? That's what, what the theory we came up with, with even the other folks I was mentioning, was that Jack and Boris did makeup tests, practice worked on it because we're talking thousands it sounds crazy but thousands of hours right were put into making this makeup the way it needed to look yeah and it was cotton and collodion and stuff and really gnarly stuff so what we believe is that they got to the point where this is what we want stuber came out and then sculpted the head okay so boom there you go follow that yeah, because they didn't have molds for foam rubber appliances, Not right? He's building close. it up with strips of cotton and gnarly chemicals. Yeah. Every single time he came in, they'd have to build a brand new monster. Eyes watering, right. skin bleeding. Something like this, it, it you would think like would be in a museum or be in the bowels of Universal. This is insane. It's only because uh, it was lost to history and yeah. literally in, in my family's house and in the attic. Sense. And it ended up in your hands like a Frankenstein, a born, died in the wool Frankenstein well, fan. That's the crazy thing. A lot of people, you know, they might have seen this and just, it would have been like, oh, cool Frankenstein. But I literally went, that's Jack Pierce. It, it, was, it was like oh Jack Pierce himself. Oh my gosh. You know, yeah, because if this, well, if this had ended up God, with someone man. else, it could have just been in a yard sale again uh, or something uh, and just carted it off. It ended up in a dump. Oh my know, gosh. Some people are like, oh, this is, yeah, this is cool. Cool, wooden right. head. Yeah, damage. Okay, well, I got to show you something before you show me your next thing. Exactly. Because this head is pretty cool. But we've got our own Frankenstein head over here. Bring that over here, George. And look at this. I want to put it next to your head. Ours is, uh, ours is in color. Yours is much smarter because look at that brain capacity. So look, uh, <laughs> you might have the original 1931 Jack Pierce reference makeup head, right. a piece of film history, but I've got this. You got that. I just wanted to show that off. Yeah, let's, uh... Are you jealous, Rob? <laughs> Yeah, are you jealous there we go Much he doesn't better. he doesn't seem jealous no, that's uh two heads are better than one so i might have to take yours oh oh my gosh all right we're getting a look 
at the reference head right now. Rob is going inside to grab some other props. He told me, hold it by the neck, not by the thing down here. So I'm not choking Frankenstein, okay? I'm just admiring. This is insane. This is something that literally belongs in a museum and may end up there if it doesn't end up in a very fancy private collection one day. Rob just invited us to see the head because he knows we're also obsessed with Frankenstein. And how cool is that, that a fan has got this piece of movie history right now. It's not in a museum and he's letting other fans touch it. I don't think we're ever going to see anything like this ever again. Oh my God. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. No. All right, Tattoo Rob, what the heck is this? This is actually a cast of Boris Karloff's right hand, which is prominently featured in the laboratory scene in the 1931 Frankenstein. Because that was not Karloff under that big tarp for all that dialogue. So there was actually a full-size dummy. Where the rest of the arm is, I would like to know. But at least we have the hand. And it is made out of resin. You can see Karloff's gnarly knuckles because he was a ditch digger, truck driver. So he had some pretty gnarly hands. Also, his hand was elongated right here. So again, I think that's why James Weld, not only for Karloff's amazing features, but his hands were so different. Yeah, they're like so recognizable. distinctive hands. I was just going to say, when you first showed us like a picture of this, I'm like, well, I don't know. It could just be any hand or whatever. Nope. But then we went to Sarah Karloff's house and she has a like a bronze cast of her dad's hand. Yeah. And it looks there's something about it when you see this in person where it's like unmistakably Karloff's hand. And so they got this with the head from the same. Yeah, Grandpa got this at the same yard sale, rummage sale, whatever, for grandma. Dude. Luckily you got the hand because most people probably would have went, what's this? Do you know how insane this story is? Like when you tell people this, they must look at you like, yeah, right. Yeah. Until they see it. Until they see it. Yeah. This is insane. This is like one of those antiques roadshow stories oh, yeah. where you're like, Absolutely. oh, what do you have? And then what is something like this worth? I don't even want to speculate, but a lot of money. A lot of money. <laughs> Because I mean, posters. What was the what was the mummy poster went for? Like, it's the most expensive God, horrible. Kirk Hammett has like I saw his collection in Salem, Mass. The right. It came out in Peabody Museum. Amazing. But yeah, we're talking five hundred thousand dollars for a yeah poster. for a for a movie for poster. A and this isn't a poster. This is oh, this is the real deal. Screen used props, folks. And that being said, again, this is where the arm was attached. This is the dead giveaway to this being so unique. Again, Karloff had amazingly incredible hands. Dude, my mind is freaking blown by seeing that in person. I mean, I knew what we were gonna see here, and I knew I was gonna be blown away by this. I did not expect to see just like a vision of Boris Karloff's hand. Well, I was talking about it earlier. Not only was this for makeup consistency in Jack Pierce's makeup studio, but this was screen used this is the head that's under the tarp during the actual laboratory scene. You can't see it, of course, it's covered up, but this is the hair, everything else. Oh my gosh. And again, this is the hand that's there during the laboratory scene. So the whole time they're size raising dummy. him up to get hit by Just lightning and all up. that stuff. Yeah. They don't need Boris Karloff sitting under there. No, and not, why risk it? Full makeup and all that. And there's scenes where like, uh, they zoom in on his hand, yeah. moot twitching. There's, or, there's one one scene where it's or it falls up close out. and it's actually, it, you can tell it's limp, but all the other pictures, if you look during the dialogue before he goes up, again, it was a full-size dummy. I, I really wish I knew where the rest of the arm was and all that. Uh, probably in a landfill. Scene, you can actually see Dwight Fry's character, Fritz, bump into the arm when he's pulling back the actual tarp, blanket, whatever, on top of Karloff. Yeah, this makes and me immediately want to just go watch the movie. Right. You've got the movie in there, right? We're going to throw that oh, movie actually, on in five I, minutes. I don't. I have it at home. <laughs> what? He uh, keeps that I, one next I, I to I his bed. Video. Okay, one more thing, though. The color, it's very, very close. But this is for the laboratory scene before the creature goes up. Right, before so the, the lightning skin hits him. Is, everything is a little different looking. Of course, it's supposed to be a corpse, so the rigidness and all that would have been fine. Once Karloff comes down and it's actually Karloff, you can completely see the color difference in the hand, especially because you can't see the hand. Right, right. But the hand, 
It goes from like looking like every other character, you know, regular, fleshy, as far as a black and white movie goes. Right, right. But then when Carla comes down, there's that really super gray look. And I never would have even thought about that. It. That he's like a dead corpse color, and that's, then he has his greenish monster -ish. That's how amazing James Well was, or whoever thought of it. And then also in Bride of Frankenstein, he's burned, and throughout the entire movie, he regenerates. The skin changes, yeah. the hair grows back. So by the end of the movie, Karloff, the creature, looks more like Karloff in Frankenstein right. than he does Bride of Frankenstein at the beginning. Dude, this is trippy. And Jack Pierce obviously famously was sort of let go when the next makeup artist came along yes. that was able to do Blood like... West Westmore. Yeah, when he was able to do all the foam latex pieces and save a lot of time, Jack was sort of considered almost like a dinosaur he's out of fashion and they they let go the guy who literally created saved universal yeah saved studios. universal studios and created all their classic monster looks they just let him go so that's what makes me wonder did they just throw out all this stuff i believe that it was pretty much clean house chuck it and what happened was you know people know schedules there's dumpster divers there's yeah. people especially then and Again, this is like pre like uh, garage sales didn't even really start happening until very late fifties, sixties. Yeah. So this was like even before that. Back in the day. You just didn't go up to someone's house and they were like throwing away all their goodies yeah. for some, you know. I can't believe this. Well, good on your grandparents for dumpster diving and saving history. Yeah. Okay, Rob, what the heck is this? This is obviously Boris Karloff. This is a practice test of Boris Karloff in full Bride of Frankenstein makeup for the movie. So when he scarred up and burned. So all the scars, all this. Oh my gosh. And obviously, you know, his his face was a little different because this was 1935, right? Did this come with the other stuff? Did they find no. this dumpster diving too or what? Um, a buddy of mine came over one night and said, hey, I know you like this kind of stuff and gave it to me. Oh and I went, gosh. are you sure? Because this looks pretty amazing. And he said, yeah, you're the one who is <laughs> supposed to have all this, literally. And I sat on it for about, probably about 10 years before ever really deciding to have someone look at it. So once we did all this, I took this also. You had this before you even had the James Whale one? I did. Oh my gosh. I had this at least, uh, probably about eight, nine years before. The story is that we believe, the experts, that this was done at Jack Pierce's personal home studio um, while they were doing makeup tests for actual Karloff for Bride of Frankenstein. So they do all the makeup on Karloff and then they make a mold. They had him stick his face with all the makeup on it into plaster. Right in there. Yeah. And then this is the positive cast from that. And again, there's who knows how many of these they, and I'm not talking about this one, they probably made just this one then probably somewhere down the line when they came up with another version, they probably stuck his face in there and did another one. Oh my gosh. But this is the only one that anyone's ever and has seen. And because his face was in the original mold that this is pulled from, you're saying that there's little hairs in there and stuff? There's little hairs. You can see like there's little bits of eyelash still stuck in there. Wow. Have you shown this to Sarah Karloff? Sarah has not seen this. Oh my gosh, you've got to show that to Sarah. <laughs> She'll lose her mind. That is so cool. All right. Well, I thought our head was tied <laughs> with the original reference head, but this puts it over the top. You win. Nice. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know about you guys, but my mind is blown. Could you tell? Even I have been rendered partially speechless during all of that because think about this 1931 frankenstein that is the granddaddy of them all that monster design influenced well the way we think of frankenstein all the way up till today jack pierce's classic makeup and that was his original reference head this is a piece of cinematic history that belongs in a museum it's just sitting right out here well at least for the moment at funeral classic so we have to give a huge shout out to rob for bringing out the family treasures to show to us out here on the side of the road and if you want to check out funeral classics you can go to funeralclassics.com and that's where he's going to have more information when they launch doing replicas of this head super high-end replicas for horror collectors 
and stuff like that. So there's an Instagram right here for Funeral Classics. And like I said, funeralclassics.com. And hey, if you guys have any weird family treasures or secrets or weird businesses you'd like us to visit on the next Random Land on location, you just let us know. Head over to randomland.com and get in touch. But for now, this has been Justin Scarred, who's a little bit Justin scared inside that creepy store there, signing off. We've done our duty. You can go home and sleep well.